The following video is not medical advice. One in five adults in the U.S. struggles with a mental illness like depression, bipolar disorder, or PTSD, and nearly half of those diagnosed with depression are also diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. Diagnosis of major depression have risen dramatically by 33%. This rate is rising even faster among millennials and adolescents, who are up 47% for boys and 65% for girls. A 2015 study found that the estimated economic impact of depression in the United States is $210 billion per year in lost productivity, a 153% increase from 83 at the turn of the century. During this mental health crisis, pharmaceutical companies have been aggressively marketing highly addictive opioid drugs to patients and doctors. This has caused an addiction epidemic that has arisen to claim the lives of more than 67,000 Americans. With more than 13 million illegal doses, tens of thousands of lives cost, and billions of dollars in profit, this is the biggest scandal in pharmaceutical history. But in this video, we're going to discuss a lesser known scandal. This is the suppression of drugs that cure depression. We've seen depression skyrocket in America over the past 10 years, and with it, the rate of prescription SSRIs has gone up over 400%. It may not come as a shock to learn that the suicide rate in America is at a record high. Every 11 minutes in America, someone takes their own life. This is a 25% increase since 1999, making this the highest rate of suicide the country has ever seen. The suicide rate among U.S. military veterans is even higher when compared to the general public, with an average of around 20 veteran suicides per day, almost double the average rate of civilian suicide. We're going to investigate two questions. Why is this happening, and what can we do to change people's lives? Depression in the brain is associated with reduced functionality of the hippocampus, resulting in memory impairment or memory suppression, reduced functionality in the prefrontal cortex, causing reduction in attention and executive control and willpower. There's also a reduced functionality of the amygdala, which directly affects mood and emotional regulation. These areas tend to be more inflamed in people who are depressed. This leads to dysfunction in brain development, learning, and mood. We know that exercise is nature's greatest antidepressant, as it boosts key areas of the brain associated with memory, learning, as well as hormones, endorphins, and brain-derived neurotrophic factor and brain plasticity. But exercise isn't being prescribed by doctors for two reasons. Number one is that exercise is free, and many people who have depression are too depressed to get up and get moving or go to the gym. And despite the 400% increase in serotonin reuptake inhibitor drugs being prescribed to the American public, depression and suicide are still at an all-time high. This is likely because SSRI drugs fail to outperform placebos in cases of mild to medium depression. In patients that are more severely depressed, the benefits of SSRIs over placebo is substantial. So if SSRIs aren't that effective, how come one in nine Americans have a prescription? Could there be a better way to heal our nation's depression? Let's rewind the clocks back to the late 1960s, when a post-mortem study revealed the decreased concentrations of serotonin in depressive suicides. Naturally, researchers hypothesized that lower amounts of serotonin were responsible for the depressive symptoms, and began developing drugs that could increase the serotonin concentration in the brain using a selective reuptake inhibitor. This led to the development of fluxetine, which was approved by the FDA in December of 1987 and was launched to market under the name Prozac. Since the introduction of Prozac to the market, other SSRIs have been developed and approved by the FDA. Fast forward to 2019. There's been a 400% increase in the prescription of these drugs since the year 2000. However, recent research has indicated that there is likely more to depression than just serotonin levels. For example, when someone begins taking an SSRI, they generally have to wait about four weeks for their symptoms to improve. However, their serotonin levels can rise as quickly as within an hour of taking the drug. It's probable that more than serotonin levels must be changed for SSRIs to work, suggesting that low serotonin levels may be a side effect of depression rather than the direct cause of it. So what's the missing link between serotonin levels and depression? Brain-derived neurotrophic factor, 
It has been called a master molecule and referred to as miracle grow for the brain by Harvard neuropsychiatrist John J. Rady. BDNF and serotonin are closely linked signaling systems. Both play regulatory roles in many neurotic functions, including survival, neurogenesis, and synaptic plasticity. A common feature of the two systems is their ability to regulate the development and plasticity of neural circuits involved in mood disorders such as depression and anxiety. BDNF promotes the survival and differentiation of 5-HT neurons. The administration of SSRIs enhances BDNF gene expression. There is also evidence for synergism between the two systems in effective behaviors and genetic epistasis between BDNF and the serotonin transporter genes. So the TLDR is that SSRIs don't work because they increase serotonin. They work because increasing serotonin leads to an increase in brain-derived neurotrophic factor. But if this mechanism only works for those with the most severe depression, what are the rest of us supposed to do? Fortunately, there are other drugs that modulate serotonin to the effect of increased BDNF and neuroplasticity. They're natural, non-toxic, and non-addictive. They've been used millions of times over thousands of years with zero recorded deaths as a direct result of the drug. This is the Entheogen Psychedelic. Unlike SSRIs, which prevent the reuptake of serotonin, psilocybin works by mimicking serotonin, causing regular consciousness to become radically disrupted. Psilocybin enhances emotional processing in the amygdala, at the same time reduces activity in areas of the brain associated with fear and self-criticism. This allows patients to better process negative emotions that were being suppressed. This is roughly the opposite effect of SSRIs, which are known for their emotional blunting effect. At high doses, users report deeply spiritual and mystical experiences, which are directly correlated with quality of life in a study of depressive patients at John Hopkins University. And there is now evidence for the hypothesis that these drugs enhance neurogenesis and the growth of new neurons. Classical serotonergic psychedelics are known to cause changes in mood and brain function that persist long after the acute effects of the drugs have subsided. Moreover, several psychedelics elevate glutamate levels in the cortex and increase gene expression in vero of the neurotrophin BDNF, as well as immediate early genes associated with plasticity. This indirect evidence has led to the reasonable hypothesis that psychedelics promote structural and functional neuroplasticity, although this assumption had never been tested rigorously. The data presented here provide direct evidence for this hypothesis, demonstrating that psychedelics cause both structural and functional changes in cortical neurons. Now let's zoom out to the psychological effects of patients with depression. Cancer patients often develop chronic, clinically significant symptoms of depression and anxiety. Previous studies suggest that psilocybin may decrease depression and anxiety in cancer patients. The effects of psilocybin were studied in 51 cancer patients with life-threatening diagnosis and symptoms of depression and or anxiety. This randomized, double-blind crossover trial investigated the effects of a very low, placebo-like dose versus a high dose. Participants, staff, and community observers rated participant moods, attitudes, and behaviors throughout the study. High-dose psilocybin produced large decreases in clinician and self-rated measures of depressed mood and anxiety, along with increases in quality of life, life meaning, and optimism, and decreases in death anxiety. At six-month follow-up, these changes were sustained, with about 80% of participants continuing to show clinically significant decreases in depressed mood and anxiety. So in plain English, the participants who took higher dosages had a more spiritual experience, and this spiritual experience had long-lasting effects on their quality of life. Recent research has also shown incredible results in smoking cessation. John Hopkins researchers reported a small number of longtime smokers who had failed many attempts to drop the habit did so after a carefully controlled and monitored use of psilocybin in the context of a cognitive behavioral therapy treatment. The abstinence rate for the study of participants was 80% after six months, much higher than the typical success rates in smoking cessation trials. The average age of the study was 51. They smoked on average 19 cigarettes a day for 31 years and had repeatedly tried and failed to stop smoking. The 80% successful quit rate is simply unprecedented in smoking cessation research. 
What we've discussed here is only a fraction of the research that has taken place on psychedelics in the past 50 years. Thousands of papers have been written on these subjects, confirming that psychedelics are safe and effective ways to medicate depression and boost BDNF, as well as heal alcohol, opioid, and smoking addictions. Other studies have confirmed inverse links between psychedelics and mental illness, finding that those who reported having had used psychedelics in the UK and US were less likely to report having a mental illness such as bipolar or depression. After so many years of well-documented use and a proven track record for being extremely effective, why is it that these drugs are not more widely used? Earlier in the video, we discussed the pharmaceutical industry's unrelenting mission to keep people sick and addicted to the tune of billions of dollars in profit, even if it means sacrificing tens of thousands of lives. America is in an addiction and depression epidemic that the pharmaceutical industry is taking full advantage of with the overprescription of SSRIs and opioid drugs. With fewer side effects and less potential for abuse, it's clear that psychedelics are the safer option to treat depression and addiction. Fortunately, this mass misinformation campaign is finally being exposed as we see the decriminalization of psychedelic entheogens in Denver, Colorado, followed by Oakland, California in just the last 30 days. Big Pharma is already losing hundreds of millions of dollars a year in profits in states that have legalized medical marijuana. Naturally occurring drugs that heal years of depression in just a few hours are the absolute antithesis of what the pharmaceutical industry is selling. We've seen the DEA and the FDA collude with pharmaceutical companies to suppress naturally occurring drugs like L-tryptophan and Kratom. These incidents have not been well documented by the media because pharmaceutical companies and drug manufacturers represent a large portion of advertising revenue for mainstream media television networks. As you may know, due to the internet, these mainstream television networks have taken huge financial blows, and you can be sure they're not about to bite one of the few hands that still feeds them, unless the story is interesting enough. Okay, I am totally out of time for this video, but if you enjoyed, please like the video and subscribe. In future videos, we'll go deeper into these connections between the FDA, the DEA, and the political agenda of the pharmaceutical industry. I've also got a lot of fun stories about things to do with psychedelics and things to not do with psychedelics from my own personal experience. So stay tuned if you want to see more, and thanks again for watching.